Thank you. Okay, last week we started the study of gifts of the Holy Spirit. And what we did is we covered the first part, which was the saving gift of the Holy Spirit. The saving gift. Anybody want to go through and tell me what the saving gifts of the Holy Spirit are and what he does with those? Pardon? Okay, yes. When he comes into our life, he convicts us of sin. And most of the time, the gift of the Holy Spirit, when, when he comes into our life as personal people, is for us. For us. In other words, let's, let's just take a look at this. He, uh, he adopts us as sons. He allows us to be adoption. He sanctifies us. He prays and intercedes for us with groanings too great for us to understand that we can't get to. Too deep for our own words. And he strengthens our inner man. All of those had passages to him. And we'd go through. Today is not a time to review all that other than to just bring it to memory. We also talked about the general gift passages that were given to the apostles and how those gifts were passed on. Does anybody remember that? Pardon? Laying of hands, okay. And only the apostles could do that and pass on the gift, right? And we saw that through numerous passages in Acts. Anybody have any questions on that? If you need a sheet, let me know. I think we can get them distributed out. Okay, today what we're going to talk about is God's gifts to the church. Because his gifts to the church are through us but they're different, and they're for a different purpose and different reasons. Now, let me say it this way. God has always gifted his people. If you look at the Old Testament, he gave gifts to the Israelites as the Holy Spirit chose. Not an indwelling gift, but he gave gifts and gifted people to do things, right? To build the tabernacle. Moses, of all the people, he had, he had gifts that hardly anybody else could even come close to. And then, what else did he do? Besides giving Moses and gifting all of those guys for the, the uh, tabernacle. To build the tabernacle. The skills to build it. The abilities to give it. What else did he do in terms of gifts? Okay, give Noah his gift, yeah, for 110 years. He built that ark, yeah. He also gave us prophets, right? Prophets that were gifted in that they could do the will of God and speak for him. Now, that, so that idea of gifts is not new. And it's not new for our people, meaning us. But let's take a look at how it did change in the New Testament and how it did change for us as it goes forward, all right? We got three gifts passages we're going to take a look at briefly. The first one is in 1 Corinthians 12. Most of you have read this thing over and over and over. Well, I want to bring something to your attention. You may already know it but we're going to read it, okay? 1 Corinthians 12. <clears throat> and we're going to pick up the, uh, the, the narrative here on uh, verse 4. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. Hold it right there. What did we just learn? What did we just learn? 
Unity. Unity. And all three of the Godhead are involved in this. The Father, God, the Lord, Jesus Christ, and the Spirit. And they all do a little bit different, but it's all for what? For one thing. And then do verse 7. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. Okay, hang on. Okay. Okay. That's verse 7. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So why are we given one of these gifts? For the common good. Is he talking about the world common good? He's talking about the church. He's talking about the church. And so each one of these, we have a gift. Each one. Each one has at least one gift of the Spirit for what? The common good. For the good of the church. Hmm. We're going to stop there. Now I want you to go to Romans. Back up a book. I want you to go back to Romans. The 12th chapter, we're going to start with verse 3. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many parts in one body, and all the body's parts do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually parts of one another. Keep going. One more verse. However, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to use them properly. If prophecy, <clears throat> if prophecy in proportion to one's faith, if service in the act of serving, or the one who teaches in the act of teaching, or the one who exhorts in the work of exhortation, or the one who gives with generosity the one who is in leadership with diligence, and the one who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Okay. I want to bring you back to uh, verse 3. Would you read verse 3 one more time, please? For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think as <clears throat> so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. What did did he just say? What did he just say? Okay, that's, that's point one. What's the second point? That's a, good, that's a good summary of that point, by the way. I'm sorry, we probably needed that up here. You Be want to humble. say that again, Hank? We're going to get you a mic so we can get you recorded. You did such an excellent job. Well, I, uh, what, I, what I believe he's saying here is that we each um, have certain gifts, and although some of us may feel that those gifts are little or inferior or not as important that what's important to understand is that each one of those gifts forms a part of everything that uh, we all need to do together and then of course the other part about not feeling one person feeling that their gift is much higher than the other but the okay, important thank point you. is that all right that was the first point what's the second point pardon humble attitude humble attitude Yeah, and I think that goes with what Hank was saying, but that wraps up what Hank said in just a very short sentence. She did that well. (laughs) A humble attitude. But there's still a second point. That's all the first. Okay, we got another one God gives everyone faith. Hang on. That these gifts are not to be used to serve ourselves, but to be used to serve the body. Okay, and he does that as as we progress through. That's true. But there's a second part of three, and I, and I guess I better get that to you. Uh, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. 
What in the world does that mean? Did he give us faith? Did God give us faith? Whoops. Nobody wants to jump into that pot. Yes. Okay. Who said that? Me and him. Me, me and him. <laughs> me, who's the him over here pointing to? <laughs> there is a gift of faith. And that's the last item on that big chart that covers two pages. There is a gift of faith. But it's not, it's, this is not what he's talking about here. This is not what he's talking about. This measure of faith, it's you are to exercise your gift in proportion of how much you believe. Not that you've been given faith, but you've got a measure of it that develops in you as you grow. And you are to use your gift or gifts as you grow to that measure. Because the gift of faith is a little bit different. How do we come by faith? It's in Romans. You're hearing by the Word of God, right? And so we don't, God doesn't open up your head. Hey, Rex, here you go. Open up Rex's head. Now you got faith, Rex. You're all set to go. That doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. God does not open your life and dump faith into you. No, he doesn't, because it's called free will. That's the other piece to the puzzle, yes. But at the same time, you can't gain faith outside of the Word. Because the Word is the working of the Holy Spirit to open us up so that we will know enough and understand enough that He can move in our life. Now, the real question is, when does all of that take place? Well, that was last week. That happens before we become a Christian. The, the setup for us to gain faith is before we're a Christian. But we can't gain enough faith to believe until we hear the Word and we understand what is being preached and taught. Once we become a Christian, then He indwells us, obviously, through our baptism. He comes in. Correct? Everybody nod yes. We know this now. All right? He comes in, and now what happens? Now He sanctifies us, and He helps us be strengthened in our inner man, and He guides us, and He opens our brains, if you go to Romans, the 12th chapter, what does it say at the beginning of the 12th chapter? It says what? Tell me verse 1. 12, 1, please. Yeah. <clears throat> Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Okay. This only happens for Christians. Hear me. The Holy Spirit does not impart gifts to non-Christians. Not on a regular basis. Now, I won't say it won't be done, but it won't be done according to Scripture to non-Christians. Because they are given for what? The common good of the church. Now, let's go to the third passage. And we'll get to that in just a second. Let's go to Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Starting with verse 11. And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Did you know that Woodland Oaks Church of Christ has specifically been gifted with men 
Amen. Specifically gifted with men for the building up of the body. Did you know that? That's what it says. Who are they? Yeah, they're your, they're your elders, your pastors, teachers, and evangelists. That's who they are. We don't have apostles anymore. Let me go back to that one just for a second. I want you to go to, uh, just flip back to Ephesians, the second chapter. Go down to verse 19. What's it say, Doug? So then, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Keep going. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. The foundation of the church is the apostles and the prophets. They don't exist anymore. Because that's the foundation. Of, and of whom we are what? What's it say? And we are now fellow citizens. And in whom the whole building, being fitted together, is growing into a holy temple to the good. And in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. That's us. That's us, people. Now... Let's go back to 1 Corinthians. So then, we can say this. Collectively, what's going on? Collectively, the church, through the Holy Spirit, we have abilities and capabilities to do what? Serve each other. To grow this body spiritually. That's what we're here for. We are here to serve each other to the glory of God and to help grow his kingdom here. That's what we're about in the church. Now, we just read it. 1 Peter 4.11, actually, let's go there. 1 Peter 4, we're going to back up to 10 and 11 because we'll probably use that piece to the puzzle too. 1 Peter 4. You ready? Yeah, go back to 10. Yep. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the multifaceted grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking actual words of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Peter wraps it up into two phrases, doesn't he? Whoever speaks is to do as one is speaking the utterances of God, and whoever serves is to do so as the one serving by the strength which God supplies. If you'll look at that chart, I think it's on the back of your first page. Or it's, yeah, it's on the back of the first page. You see a bunch, you see the list of gifts. Peter takes those gifts and he divides them into two classifications. Those of speaking and those of serving. That's the way he puts it together. Paul gets a little bit more, more definitive. Do we need some more sheets to people? Who needs another sheet? You need one back here? We got it. Okay.
So we do it to God's glory. And then in 1 Corinthians 14, we're going to find the same thing. We do it to, glory, to the glory of God. And we'll get to first. well, don't know whether we'll make it or not. 1 Corinthians 14, 12. So you too, since you are eager to possess spiritual gifts, strive to excel for the edification of the church. Wow. So if we want to have gifts, if you want to serve in the church, what should be your goal? Strive means to work for, hard, work for. That's what that Greek word means, strive. What should we be working for? Using our gifts. Glory of God and for the what? Unification of the church, which brings glory to God. If you're not striving to use your gift to unify the church and to glorify God, you're not, you haven't got your right mindset. You haven't got your right mindset. Funny thing about gifts, we read part of the 12th chapter, we'll probably take another chunk of the 12th chapter before it's over, but the funny thing about gifts is that uh, of the 13 epistles that Paul wrote, and that's not counting Hebrews, but of the 13 epistles that Paul wrote, (laughs) 1 Corinthians is the only one that makes mention of gifts. And that's in chapter 12 and chapter 14. The rest of them are silent about gifts, other than what you read in Ephesians, that he gave gifts to the church, but he doesn't talk about them. He doesn't expand it. He doesn't explain it. That's it. And then you got them in Romans, too. But there, what's the point in Romans? What's the focus? What's the focus? I fail. We covered that last week, guys. You've got different gifts. And you get different gift passages. Why aren't they all the same? Why didn't the Apostle Paul, in every place that he mentioned gifts, pop up with the same gifts? Why different passages in different places? Different audience. Pardon? Different audience. Different audience, different purpose, yes, different reason. That's what it's all about, and that's why we have the different gifts passages. They are not complete by any means. They are not complete by any means. Can anybody think of a gift that's not on this passage that we know exists in the church? I'm going to surprise you in just a minute. If you don't come up with it, I'm going to, I'm going to give it to you. Can anybody come up with a gift that we have in Woodland Oaks, Church of Christ, that's not on one of these passages? His name is Sonny. What gift does Sonny have? Music. It's not on one of these passages. But does anybody in here not believe that Sonny has not been gifted by the Holy Spirit? That one is just flat out face evident. But we've got other gifts that have been given to the church all through the age that aren't listed in this passage, or these passages. Now what does that tell you? Think about it for just a second. What does that tell you? Did the gifts that were in the Old Testament, and the prophets, and those people, last all through the ages? No, they changed. Why did they change? Conditions changed. 
Culture changes. And when those things happen, what happens to the church? The gifts that the Holy Spirit gives to the church change to meet the needs of what's going on, that meets the needs of the church. The gifts are always given to the church to glorify God and to help us unify, edify, and grow the church. And if it's needed tomorrow and it's not needed today, trust the Holy Spirit, that gift will be given. Doesn't mean it'll last, but it'll be given. After 1 Corinthians 12, there are no healing episodes as examples that are given as gifts. In fact, there are just four opposite that were given. Let me just, uh, let me go through it for a minute. Uh, I'll just give you one. There's uh, four times non-healing events happened that could have been healing events but weren't. 2 Corinthians 12.7 Because of the extraordinary greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Philippians 2.25-30 But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need, because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I have sent him all the more eagerly, so that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less concerned about you. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy, and hold people like him in high regard, because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to compensate for your absence in your service to me. So God spared him. doesn't say he spared him miraculously, but God does heal. Now that's a caution. Here, listen to me very carefully. Here's a caution. Do not confuse God's answers to prayer with a gift from the Holy Spirit. For instance, we're talking about healing, right? Okay, so let's just stay there for a minute. If the gift of healing still exists, then it needs to operate the same way that it's always operated in the, in the New Testament. But God can heal anybody, anytime, any place, anywhere. And through prayer, He can, according to His will, respond to that. But that is not the gift of healing. You get it? I didn't see a bunch of heads shaking yes. I heard a couple say, "Uh uh-huh. But did you get it? Yeah. Come on. All right. Let's, Let's continue down that line for just a minute. So how would we classify gifts? Well, there are permanent gifts, and then there are temporary. Permanent here on earth. I don't know what's going to happen in heaven. But permanent here on earth. And then there are temporary here on earth. And we've already talked about maybe one or two. Well, how do you know they're temporary? Well, let me show you something. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians 13. Well, wait a minute, that's the love chapter, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, well, it's also another chapter that tells you something else. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 13. What are you reading from, Doug? Whatever version you want. 
A, for, NASB is what you told me last time. Yeah, so good. That's, what I'm that's it. Let's okay. try that one for now. E ESV would be fine, but NASB is okay too. I can switch it if you'd like. No, no. Okay. A, NASB. Keep going. Where do you want me to read from? Uh, let's try from the 13th chapter. Let's try verse 8. And then 9 and 10. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away with. For we know in part and prophecy in part. But when the perfect comes, <clears throat> the partial will be done away with. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. Okay. This one sort of does you I want you to, to notice something in verse 8 it says there are gifts of prophecy or there is prophecy they will be done away key on that particular verb done away a group in English and then what does it do Tongues, they will cease. Done away, cease. Huh. And if knowledge, it will be done away. Oh, we're back to done away again. Done away, cease, done away. Is it just because they want to change the English up? No, they use different words in Greek purposefully. Let me explain. This is, this is as far as we need to go. Done away. It is a passive. Now, you English majors all the way back to sixth grade, what is passive versus active? If, if a verb is passive or a verb is active, what does it mean? Come on. Okay, so the first thing is, prophecy is going to have something done on it to make it go away. That's what it says, right? Because it's passive, done away. And then knowledge is going to have something done on it that's going to do what? Done away. To, that makes it go away. So what, why did the Greek change the word. Why did the writer, why did the Holy Spirit change the word in the middle of this? Why didn't he just say, done away, done away, done away? Why did he say, cease in the middle of that? Because he changes not only the verb, but he changes the meaning by saying, that's not active or passive. In the Greek, they have this weird thing called middle, which means it acts on itself. Well, how does tongues, languages, act on themselves? Okay, let's put it all together. Let's bring it all together. What could the, not, rephrase. People who received the gift of languages from an apostle, could they pass that gift on? <coughs> No. So when they died, what happened? It ceased. It acted on itself and it did away from itself. There was no need for it anymore. Why was there no need? Because the word was complete, had been developed, had been written by the Holy Spirit. Now, prophecy. Something will act on prophecy. Something will act on knowledge. We could keep going through that, but the, if you read the rest of the chapter in that pieces part, you'll find out what all that is. It's when the fullness, when it comes, when Christ comes and the whole thing comes around. But the point is, those particular gifts, gone. They are gone. 
healings are gone. The gift, the gift of prophecy, well, it's still here, but it's what? It's, it's, it's done too, because why? It was a foundation to the church. Do you all understand what's being said here? Yes, sir. Give him the mic. I'm going to see if I can recap what you've been saying to make sure that I understand it. <laughs> that whether we're talking about active or passive or middle, that all of these things that are mentioned here in verse 8 as the miraculous manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the first century were there to accomplish a certain purpose in terms of building the foundation of the church and confirming that this message that was coming from Christ, coming from the apostles, was the foundation that people needed to obey and to listen to. And That's that once that confirmation was made, these gifts have accomplished their purpose and they were therefore done away with because there was no more need for them to accomplish that purpose. That's correct. Or at least the ones, the ones that are gone, yes. <laughs> the ones that are gone. Because there are a couple of permanent ones like knowledge. It still exists as a gift. Let me be clear. Let, let's, let's go back. Let's go back to uh, Ephesians 4. Yeah, I got four, five more whole minutes. All right, let's go back to Ephesians 4. Do verse 11, and I'll stop you at some point, so don't. And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets. They're gone. They are gone. Why? Because in chapter 2, we found out what? In chapter 2, 19, they were the foundation of the church. They were the foundation of the church. And so they're not here anymore. Keep going. Some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. For okay. The... Now, evangelists, pastors, teachers, what are they here for? To continue. Equip the saints. For the work of service. You don't get equipped in here or in service during worship or what Sean gives us. We don't come to those places just to hear and feel good. We come to be what? Equipped for service. We come equipped so that we can serve, that we can use our gift or gifts to glorify God. That's why we come. That's why these, this takes place. That's why the other classes are taking place. That's why sermons are preached on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday. It's to equip us so that we better understand to be able to use the gifts. That's why we have ministries in the church. That's why we have different ministries and different people gravitate towards those ministries. So don't get upset if somebody asks you, hey, you know, Hank, I think maybe you ought to be serving here because we've seen that you're good at this and this. Now, what's a gift? A gift is not just something that you've been trained to do at a university. A gift is not just something that you do because you were born with an ability of good mechanical understanding or something. That's not a gift. Believers and non-believers, those who have the Holy Spirit and those who don't, can do those things. A gift is something that is specifically given to you and to others in the church for the purpose of glorifying God in the church and building the church up. Thank you. That's exactly why they're given. We've got people in the church that can evangelize, that are really good at it. We ought to support them. Why? Because that gift will help build the church. People that don't use their gifts and don't allow availability to themselves from the body in which they serve 
are actually denying God. They're actually denying God. Because he put you here for a reason. He gave you a gift for a reason. You need to be using it. Now, someone said, well, they don't give me a chance to. I can't do it. Listen. We've got, we've got godly men that lead this place. They're called elders, shepherds, whatever you want to say. They can spot people that are gifted. And they will allow you and ask you and encourage you to use your gifts. It may not be what you want to do. Many of us want to do some other things. But they, they're asking you to do something because the church needs you. And they need, it, you need to be used to glorify God. All right. My time's up in less than a minute. Questions? I did that well. <laughs> yeah, Jimmy? 1310, um, when it says perfection in the NIV, is that a good translation? 1310? Yeah. Perfection. And is that the second coming of Christ, or is that the word completed? Oh, hang on just a second. When the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. That says when the perfect, that's the complete. That word is teleos. It means complete. The completion comes. That's what it means. That's, that's the word. Our word is perfect. Their word is completion. Or the fulfillment. Peace.